Hello and welcome to the special conversation that we're having with Chris Wright, CTO of Red Hat. Now, Chris has been a technologist for the last nearly three decades. He's been the CTO of Red Hat for nearly a decade. He's seen many tech cycles and he's here in Mumbai after more than five years for the Red Hat AI Summit. Chris, thank you very much for joining in. It just feels like it's all happening here in India. You're here after more than five years. We've got that NVIDIA Summit with Jensen himself is here. It, I think it shows the importance of India as uh, a, a leader in technology creation and adoption. So it's awesome to be here. I, I love India. I love the culture. I love uh, experiencing the people. And I love the food. Absolutely. OK, so let's uh, straight away get to you know business and technology. Uh, so cloud was seen as this building block for any successful digital transformation. But off late, a word which is getting some prominence is cloud exit, where companies are rethinking their cloud strategies. They have found out that uh, you know, the cost of cloud ownership uh, over a longer term is more than what they had anticipated, and therefore they're either moving or thinking about moving some of their applications on-prem. What would your thoughts be on cloud exit? Well, we've been working in this cloud space for quite some time. And our focus has been on something that we call hybrid cloud or open hybrid cloud. And that was always about creating flexibility of where do you best deploy applications? On premises in your own data center or in a public cloud? And one of the challenges with public cloud is the potential cost. If you build a cloud native solution and you're really focused on cost management, you can make it cost effective. Certainly if you're doing bursting, but for certain applications, it may be just simply better to host those within the enterprise. So we do see this importance of having a balance and choice and flexibility between the on-premises and the public cloud. But public cloud, would you acknowledge that the cost of ownership of public cloud is higher than what companies had earlier anticipated? Many companies are shocked by the, the cost of, of porting their or bringing their applications into the cloud. Mm -hmm. And I think the real issue there is understanding how to best leverage cloud services um, where you're doing what's called cloud native design or where you're taking your existing assumptions of how things work within a data center and moving them to the cloud, that latter is completely not cost effective. Okay, so while it's not applicable for Red Hat and your enterprise customer, since you do have a hybrid cloud strategy that you advocate to your clients, but would you agree that there is some cloud repatriation which is taking place? Oh, we absolutely see movement in both directions. Both Some people are, are actually still looking at how do we take our applications and move them into the cloud. And at the same time, if you find the right uh, application that's just better served within your data center, we see customers bringing them back to the data center. So I think it's a very dynamic space. The other big uh, you know, uh, innovation has been AI. And that's also seen as a cornerstone. It's seen as a technology which is going to change the entire landscape. What are your thoughts on AI? Well, it's super yeah. exciting. Um, you can't have a conversation in technology without talking about AI. The promise is amazing. It, the introduction of generative AI that's been exposed to the broad public uh, has just ignited everybody's imagination of what's possible. The challenge is figuring out how to take that potential and turn it into something real for a business. And there's real work to be done there. It's an example where uh, leveraging your own internal infrastructure can be extremely cost effective compared to leveraging cloud services, so to the earlier point. Um, but how do we manage identifying the key use cases, which are often dependent on data that sits within an enterprise, and turning that data into a valuable asset in the form of a machine learning model? I think that's the trick that everybody's trying to understand what that means for their businesses. Give me a few use cases which you know in which AI has been a valuable asset, and it's made solutions possible, which either two, three years back you would have thought were impossible. There's Three. innumerable use cases. Uh, some are in the context of computer vision. Uh, a use case that I like to cite because it's sort of ironic is we're using computer vision with one of our industrial automation uh, customers to literally watch paint dry. Think of that as the most boring job for humans, but it's a way to understand the, the quality of the manufacturing process in a way that can be very precise and then even impact uh, the, the way paint is applied to the surface. Uh, many customers are experimenting internally with chatbots so that they can answer questions, whether it's to customers or whether it's to internal consumers. Uh, so an easy example that, that's accessible to many. Uh, we see it as a productivity improvement tool for all sorts of tasks. Uh, developers are looking at coding assistance. Uh, you know, creators are looking at design assistance. So 
it's, I mean, it's hard to name just, just one task and it's pervasive. And that's why I think we're also excited about the potential of AI. So this coder assistance, has it resulted in job losses, at least at the lower level? Would you say AI is yeah. causing job no, it's, losses? It's a great question. It's a conversation that we have a lot internally with my own developers. Uh, the way I see it is uh, most development teams have essentially an infinite backlog of work to do. So being more productive doesn't mean we're eliminating jobs. It means we're enabling our teams to just be more to do efficient more. and yeah, get more To do done. more with less. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What about generative AI? Since you spoke about chatbots, I think one of the most uh, pervasive uses of generative AI will be chatbots. So now we're in the second year of generative AI. So initially, whenever there is a new technology, uh, there is euphoria. The crowd rushes in. They gush over the potential, the risks. And then over a period of time, maturity sets in on what the technology can or cannot do. Where are we in the generative AI cycle? And do you think it's got the potential to change the world? Uh, to start backwards, I do think it has the potential to, to really fundamentally change the IT landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are in that the burgeoning part of the hype cycle, and then we have, you know, we drop into the trough of disillusionment. We're in that space where we're just starting to recognize what are the challenges and what are the potentials where, you know, how do we actually make this into real business outcomes? Mm -hmm. uh, and what that means to me is I'm not a fan of the hype cycles because it's confusing for everybody. Everything suddenly is better, brighter, faster, improved. Let's get to what's real. What's and I real? really like grounding it in reality and having concrete use cases. And I think we're just transitioning from pure hype into those real, real use cases. So give me a few real cases, except chatbots. Give me a few more. Uh, well, one of the things that we're doing internally is using AI to improve the relationship between our customers and our knowledge base. So as they look for solutions to challenges with their, their systems that are built from our software, they search our knowledge base and then we use AI to re-rank the answer to give them the most prominent solution so they don't have to spend a lot of time sifting through all the details. And in fact, we also use that internally for our sport engineers so they can create better sport relationships with our customers. Uh, another example is how we do summarization. Uh, so in, in our context internally for support, we have these severe uh, sev severity top severity cases where you have to follow the sun in order to keep the case uh, transitioning forward. Each one of those handoffs requires some summary. That summary is done by an engineer. It's a lot of effort. So if we can do that summarization with AI, we can have our engineers focus on solving the real problems, which is a great example of building efficiency and productivity. Fair enough. What about India? You started off by saying that India, in a way, has become the hotbed of innovation. Things are happening here. Tell us the importance of India, um, you know, in terms of innovation, in terms of um, you know, leading and following technology, and even for Red Hat and its aspirations here. Yeah, well, we have offices right here in India. So we have a lot of engineering presence in Pune and Bangalore, uh, and relationships with universities to really bring the talent that's coming out of all the universities in India focused on technology, development, and data science into Red Hat to help us build and scale our own business. Uh, India is a great place for us where, where we do business at scale. So if take, for example, the UPI initiative, which is establishing an, an identity for a one and a half billion people. Uh, operating at that scale, we learn a lot in terms of how we build and improve the scalability and performance of our software when we work with companies here in India. And it's not limited to the government. It's in financial services. It's in telecommunications. Every context, there's scale as a, as a critical aspect. Uh, and then I love the fact that um, that technical focus that comes out of the universities for the population of developers here in India is also excited about open source. So we see a lot of open source activities coming from Indian developers to global communities. In fact, when we host events here, they're huge. And there's so much interest and enthusiasm around open source that you know, we, we have all these different aspects. It's, it's our own business, uh, it's our own people, and it's connecting Indian developers to the broader global communities. So every time you visit a place, you come away with an impression about the place, a long lasting memory. In this trip, what would that be? Well, I was privileged enough to spend time with our office in Pune where we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. The thing that stood out is the passion, the enthusiasm, the potential. I mean, there's just a lot happening here and our associates are tapped into all of that. And of course, there was a cultural vibrancy to the celebration, which was itself really fantastic. But it's that 
that passion, that enthusiasm, and the, the hunger for opportunity that I, I really feel is, is amazing here in India. Chris, enjoy your trip in India. Um, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.